So I'm going to be talking about the molecular neuropharmacology of lysergic acid diethylamide, otherwise known as LSD, or by its street name acid. So LSD was first synthesized by Albert Hoffman in 1938. He was a synthetic chemist who was very interested in the alkaloids of ergot fungus. The hallucinogenic properties of LSD were not discovered until five years later in 1943, completely on accident when Albert Hoffman accidentally absorbed some LSD through his fingertips when revisiting his previous experiments. LSD is a member of a class of drugs called ergolines, and itself is a semi-synthetic ergoline de derivative. LSD is a psychoactive drug that alters human consciousness in very profound ways. This is where LSD gets its notoriety as a psychedelic drug because it induces these intense psychedelic trips that last from anywhere between 6 to 15 hours. 12 hours is the average uh, length of time that LSD stays psychoactive. LSD was a pro popular legal recreational drug in the early 60s, and about eight years later, after it began uh, gaining popularity, it was banned on a federal level and scheduled as a Schedule One controlled substance. So what are the effects of LSD? Well, first of all, it should be noted that LSD is active at a very, very low dose, at about 100 micrograms, and anything above this threshold will cause the user to experience a very intense psychedelic experience. So what is this psychedelic experience that I'm talking about? The psychoactive effects of LSD, they include uh, synesthesia, which is um, the intermingling of senses, such as being able to smell music or feel colors, and so on. Pretty much any combination of the five senses can be involved in synesthesia. And also, as most people know, LSD causes very intense hallucinations, and this is due to the increased connectivity of different parts of the brain with the visual cortex. So LSD affects serotonin receptors, and as the name of these receptors implies, serotonin receptors have an endogenous agonist, a natural binding drug called serotonin, which is in our bodies at all times. And these uh, serotonin receptors are located all throughout our body. However, um, the serotonin receptors that are responsible for the psychedelic trip mostly exist in the central nervous system, particularly the 2A type serotonin receptor. So LSD and serotonin both bind to this receptor. And this raises the question, why does LSD cause a psychedelic experience, but not serotonin? And if this was the case, if serotonin caused the same effects as LSD by binding to this receptor, then we would just be tripping all the time. So there's some kind of interesting effects going on with LSD, which is what we're going to be exploring today. So to understand why LSD has such unique effects, we have to understand the various pathways that serotonin can activate in its receptor. Now serotonin, when it binds to a serotonin receptor, Particularly, we're talking about the 2A type receptor, but it does this with all serotonin receptors. Serotonin first activates this G protein pathway, which essentially activates the neuron electrically. This is a classic synaptic firing of neurons, and is what most people understand to be the primary function of serotonin. However, serotonin also activates this beta arrestin pathway. Beta arrestin is a protein that's involved in terminating the G protein signal. So if there was no protein to terminate the G protein signal, then it would just be like holding your finger on a keyboard, right? There would be nothing to end the signal and recycle the receptor and prepare it for new binding. Um, but what's been appreciated very recently is that Beta arrestin also has its own signal transduction pathways. So it's not simply an off switch. It actually signals on its own. And the way it does this is actually quite interesting. It acts kind of like a molecular tinker toy joint. So I'm referring to these uh, circular wooden tinker toy joints that most people played with when they were kids. Beta arrestin acts like a joint for other signaling proteins to bind to it. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the consequences of this later on. 
So this is the typical signal transduction of a serotonin receptor with serotonin. All right, so we're not talking about LSD quite yet. This is what happens in our bodies all the time simply with serotonin. First, serotonin binds to the 5-hydroxytryptamine receptor, and it activates this G-protein pathway. The G-protein pathway, of course, is related to the G-protein, which is this green blob here. And after it's activated, these beta, gamma, and alpha subunits separate. And it's kind of funny, the G-protein just slides along the underside of the cell membrane. In particular, the alpha subunit separates from the beta and gamma subunits, so these stay together. The alpha subunit, however, slides towards this enzyme phospholipase C, or PLC for short. When alpha subunit makes contact with PLC, PLC will cleave this molecule PIP2, and it cleaves it into diacylglycerol and IP3. IP3 is really where the interesting effects happen because this molecule here, it travels to the mitochondria, and when it goes through the mitochondria, the mitochondria takes this as a signal to release calcium into the cytosol of the neuron. And this flooding of calcium causes the calcium ions, which are charged particles, to flow out of this calcium channel. When ions flow out of the calcium channel, this creates an electrical current um, and what we understand to be the cause of synaptic firing. The next part, which is the beta arrestin pathway, so this is the off switch of the G-protein pathway. After the beta and gamma subunits have separated from the receptor during normal activation, right, this protein, G-protein receptor kinase 2, will come in attach itself to the underside of the receptor with the help of the G-protein subunits, and they have a concerted effect where they phosphorylate the underside of the receptor. This phosphorylation, this is the off switch, this is where the signal termination happens, because now the G-protein can't just recombine and then slide back to activate the receptor again. It has to uh, be blocked by these phosphate groups. However, the beta arrestin, this protein that I compared to a molecular tinker toy, it comes in and it sees that uh, phosphate groups are here and it likes that so it attaches to them. And after attaching, this is where it starts to act like a joint. It attaches these other signaling proteins to it. Now, beta arrestin's uh, most well-known function is to result in endocytosis, so the membrane will pinch off and a, a, a lysosome will float down into the cell and ultimately will recycle the receptor. So a bunch of enzymes will come in and they'll work together to separate the uh, molecule from its receptor and they'll work together to um, dephosphorylate the receptor to kind of just reset it and then the uh, lysosome will come back and recombine with the cell membrane. However, while this is happening, while this uh, this bubble is floating down through the cell, it's taking these other signaling proteins with it. And since these signaling proteins, they're so localized, they're, they're all close together, it allows stimulation of their respective signaling transduction pathways. Now the reason this works is because you've got to imagine that a cell is relatively large compared to a protein. And so these proteins, most of them anyway, can be in anywhere in the cell at any given time. However, since beta arrestin is allowing them to stick together, it's creating a scaffold of these signaling proteins, now they can be in the right place at the right time. And so this causes their respective signal transduction pathways to be uh, activated more readily. So where does this lead to with LSD? Well, remember that what we looked at earlier with the G protein pathway and the beta arrestin pathway, those two pathways are activated simultaneously by serotonin. However, ergolines such as LSD, they activate mostly the beta arrestin pathway. We call this functional selectivity. It's stimulating the beta arrestin pathway more readily. 
not to say that Beta Arrestin is being activated solely, but rather it's more likely for Beta Arrestin to come in and activate the, the, its respective pathways as opposed to the G protein. So since we know that LSD is probably activating this pathway, we can assume that the Beta Arrestin pathway, whatever signal transduction properties it has, which is still being well understood because it's a relatively new territory in biochemistry, um, its pathways are, res are responsible for the psychedelic trip, specifically in the serotonin receptor 2A, because LSD binds to all 13 different kinds of serotonin receptors, but only the 2A receptor results in the psychedelic trip, at least as far as we know. So where does this lead to? Well, about two months ago, um, in January of 2017, a paper was released um, where it reported the crystal structure of LSD docked to its serotonin receptor. So what this allows us to do is it allows us to piece together an actual picture of LSD bound to its receptor. So we can look, actually see LSD bound to the serotonin receptor. And perhaps more importantly, we can take this picture and feed it into a supercomputer and perform molecular dynamic simulations. So basically this allows us to see how the serotonin receptor and LSD interact in real time. And this ultimately accumulates in a really interesting explanation for why LSD is so potent and why it lasts so long. So just getting into the methods of this this um, elucidation of the crystal structure of LSD bound to its receptor. LSD was synthesized in this paper using the method of Johnson. In uh, 1973, this synthesis was first reported. Um, however, it must be still viable because they decided to use it and the starting material was simply d lysergic acid monohydrate, otherwise, um, otherwise known as just a lysergic acid molecule that does not have the diethylamide attached to it. The crystallography was pr actually performed on a 2B serotonin receptor. So this is actually okay because 2B serotonin receptors are very, very similar to 2A serotonin receptors. However, if you look at this slide here, you see that 2B can be found in so many places in the human body, whereas 2A is just found in the central nervous system. So it's simply more convenient to harvest a 2B serotonin receptor for this experiment. Um, however, the results can still be um, it's extrapolated to a 2A serotonin receptor very easily. The crystallography was done with a synchrotron, so which is like a particle accelerator that uh, produces x-rays, and then this x-ray is used to uh, do diffraction experiments on the crystal. And the resolution is 2.9 angstroms, which is actually very good. This is a very resolved picture of LSD bound to the receptor. And the molecular dynamics simulations were performed in AMBER 2015. And this is it. This is LSD bound to a human serotonin receptor. You can see that LSD is kind of shifted towards the right, and that's because it's interacting mostly with helices 3, 5, and 7. This is what confirms for us that LSD is biasing the beta arrestin pathway, because if it was a little bit closer to the middle, we could indic it would indicate that LSD is activating um, these helices as well, helices 1 and 2. And these helices, um, I think specifically helis, helix 2, is responsible for um, the G protein pathway. So keep in mind that very small conformational changes in the serotonin receptor will determine which, which uh, signal transduction pathway it activates. Here, this is a close-up image of LSD. Um, it shows the structure of serotonin embedded in it, and this is why LSD can even bind to these serotonin receptors in the first place. Additionally, you have uh, these nonpolar interactions from 
Helix 7, Helix 3, and Helix uh, 3 as well, um, with the diethylamide group. And then you have this salt bridge forming between aspartic acid and Helix 3 with the ergoline nitrogen. And then you have hydrogen bonding effects from Helix 5 with the glycine residue and the indole nitrogen of LSD. And this is just another close-up image here, where here you can actually see the amino acid residues. Um, and we have a space-filling model now. So you can see that the skeletal structure of LSD is a little bit deceiving because the electron density actually spreads out much farther than the atoms. So this is a more realistic picture of how the serotonin receptor feels LSD bound to the binding pocket. So here's the catch. This is where this is all leading to. Upon closer examination of this LSD receptor structure, we find a very surprising feature. Um, an extracellular loop, which is basically just a string of amino acids that exists outside of the receptor, but is attached to the receptor still. It acts kind of like a lid that closes LSD inside of the receptor. This lid is undoubtedly responsible for LSD's long residence time and potency because um, we find that LSD actually has a, is excreted from the body in about like six hours. Um, this is why you can't drug test for LSD if it's very, very, very quickly is excreted from the body. However, it's kind of contradictory because we know that LSD lasts in the body for about 12 hours. Um, specifically in the serotonin receptor. It's somehow sitting in the receptor for 12 hours. However, it's excreted from the body um, just so quickly. So for a while, this was kind of shrouded in mystery. We didn't really know why LSD was sticking inside of the receptor so well. And this is a, just a really brilliant explanation of that. And here it is. This is the actual picture, um, a cross-section view of the receptor with LSD bound to it. And here you can see this extracellular loop forming a lid over LSD. So to understand why LSD is so good at um, optimizing this lid closing interaction, we have to understand some structure function relationships of other ergolines, specifically ergotamine, which not a lot of people know is actually very, very closely related to LSD. It also is a member of the ergoline family. However, um, ergotamine is often used as a migraine medication, and it doesn't have any hallucinogenic effects. The key difference between LSD and ergotamine is this amide substituent. You can see that this nitrogen here has different substitutions than the nitrogen of ergotamine. And the consequences of this is that they have vastly different uh, um, interactions in the serotonin receptor. So here we can compare LSD and ergotamine bound to the same receptor. Remember, this is the 2B receptor, which is pretty much the same thing as the 2A receptor. Um, but here we see that ergotamine, it, this, this amide substituent, it's just so big that it doesn't allow for the lid to close in on the receptor. And you can see here, if you look closely, um, the, the lid is actually interacting with the receptor. There's nonpolar interactions between a uh, leucine residue on the lid and with the receptor. And these are the results of the molecular dynamics simulations. So surprisingly, we find that the lid can actually close in on LSD with or without, I'm sorry, the lid can actually close in on the receptor with or without LSD bound to it. So what this means is that before LSD even binds to the receptor, the lid is opening and closing um, every now and then. And the lid can sometimes fluctuate to the side, as seen here. And when that happens, LSD can sneak in and bind to the receptor. However, once LSD binds, the lid interaction with the receptor is optimized. There's a conformational change in the receptor. The receptor changes its shape ever so slightly, and a kind of latching effect occurs between the nonpolar amino acids of the receptor and the lid. 
And so the consequence of this is that the lid fluctuates to the side much more readily before LSD binds to it. And so it can enter more easily than it can actually exit. Once LSD gets inside of the receptor, it can't exit very easily because this fluctuation doesn't occur as readily. So if we look at this slide, we see that the main difference between LSD and ergotamine is their size. This obviously has something to do with the fact that the, L the lid can close in on LSD. However, what, a, what, what else can we say about LSD that optimizes this interaction between the lid and the receptor? It's been um, suspected for a long time that the diethyl amide group of LSD is critical in its hallucinogenic activity. Um, however, to confirm this, we perform an assay of three other LSD derivatives to basically just show the significance of the diethyl amide moiety. Um, we want to see if LSD derivatives with amide substituents that look like the rhodomer of diethyl amide, we want to see if they um, cause a strong beta arrestin response as well. So we use these four molecules, one of them of course being LSD, but the others, you notice that they look a lot like LSD, but there is a slight difference, and it's their amide substituents. The nitrogen has different groups attached to it. The one that looks closest to LSD is this SS azetidide, um, or SSAZ for short. It's much easier to say. Um, SSAZ, you notice that the arms of the methyl groups are very similar to the arms of the ethyl groups of LSD. So they have a very similar conformation, and it, we suspect that this is going to cause a similar response with the receptor. Um, RR azetidide has an opposite conformation, so that would be good to test to see if the um, stereoisomer matters. And then, of course, we test LSA, or just simply lysergic acid. And we don't suspect that this is going to do anything, but it can't hurt to try. And unsurprisingly, we find that SSAZ gives a much stronger beta arrestin response than the other molecules, even LSD. So if someone were to actually take this drug, um, they would trip way harder than if they had taken LSD. And so basically, this just confirms for us that the diethyl amide conformation inside of the receptor is key to optimizing the receptor lid interactions. And in fact, the rigidity of the azetidine ring, which is this square ring here, it actually results in an even stronger beta arrestin response because the diethyl amide it has free rotation about these ethyl groups. Whereas there's no free rotation with this ring here, it can't uh, rotate side to side when attached to this nitrogen. Um, and so it's much more likely for this ring to be locked in the correct position for the interactions to occur. And basically what we can say about this is that the confirmation of diethyl amide is very important to the signaling activity because it potentiates the beta arrest in signaling by optimizing nonpolar interactions between the lid and the receptor. So where is this all leading to? Why is this any of this important? Well, there has been a resurgence in scientific interest in LSD for its potential therapeutic applications. Um, most notably, recently, there has been applications of, of LSD to cluster headaches. Um, also, there ha is applications of LSD to psychiatric conditions, such as anxiety associated with life-threatening conditions. So people on their deathbeds will find that taking a psychoactive dose of LSD will alleviate their depression and anxiety associated with dying. Additionally, um, taking LSD at a psychoactive dose has been found to um, have some relief with substance abuse. So people who are addicted to drugs, people who are alcoholics, they find that um, LSD helps them get off their respective addiction. And this has been known since the 50s, right, when um, people used to do uh, LSD experiments in controlled settings and medical settings with uh, volunteers, people who are alcoholics or 
um, addicted to some kind of drug, they would come in and basically trip under a controlled setting with psychologists and doctors around. And it was reported that many of them experience alleviation of their respective addiction. So back to cluster headaches, because this is probably one of the most interesting applications of LSD. Cluster headaches are regarded as one of the most painful conditions. They're nicknamed suicide headaches because they are simply so painful. And there is no effective treatment or means of prevention. You can give someone oxygen, like put an oxygen mask on them while they are having a cluster headache. Um, however, it has a very low success rate and it can't really be used at least to my knowledge, to effectively prevent a cluster headache attack from coming on. And cluster headaches usually come on in a very periodic manner. You can usually predict um, their onset because of their relationship with the hypothalamus, which is this area of the brain that controls autonomic functions, sleep, and body temperature. And so there's a kind of an internal clock with the hypothalamus. Um, but also it is, acts kind of like a thermostat, so it controls body temperature as well. And the hypothalamus is functionally related to this ophthalmic nerve um, that runs through behind the eye. Um, it's called the trigeminal nerve, and this is why people experience cluster headaches behind usually one eye. And it's often mistaken with migraines for this reason, and there is a difference between migraines and uh, cluster headaches. This nerve as I said, is functionally related to the hypothalamus, and I suspect that LSD alleviates cluster headaches because of its effects on the hypothalamus, which are reported by many users of LSD in a recreational sense. People report increases in body temperature. They um, report insomnia. You know, it's, a, it's impossible to sleep while you're on LSD for reasons other than you're simply um, having a good time or you're simply tripping or you're uh, frightened to go to sleep. It's not, it doesn't have to do with that. There is a, um, a very good reason why LSD makes it so you can't sleep, and I suspect it's because of the interactions with the hypothalamus. So that's my theory for why LSD can alleviate cluster headaches. So interestingly, it was found that LSD and psilocin, which is the active compound in magic mushrooms, they both treat attacks very well, and they not only alleviate symptoms, but they put them in remission, so they prevent the symptoms from happening again for a period of time. This is absolutely huge. Um, there are no known effective compounds that have these effects on cluster headaches. And what's more is that it has these effects at sub-psychoactive doses, so you don't have to actually trip in order to get the relieving effects. Um, a study was done with eight participants, uh, with LSD specifically, there are much more participants with uh, psilocin, but with LSD, seven of them experienced relief. This may seem uh, kind of dismal on the surface, however, keep in mind that cluster headaches are notoriously resistant to placebo effects. There is a 0% success rate with placebo drugs on cluster headaches. And additionally, hundreds of people in online communities, they ex report relief with uh, microdosing LSD, so taking uh, these sub-psychoactive dosages. So in conclusion, the serotonin receptor, it takes on this beta arrestin biased state when bound to LSD, and the beta arrestin pathway is responsible for LSD's psychoactive effects, at least in the 2A serotonin receptor. And the, the real characteristics of this beta arrestin pathway, and there are many pathways associated with it, right, because it creates the signal protein scaffold, um, it's still being understood. It's a vast field. People spend their entire lives studying signal protein, signal pathways. Um, so there's much to be learned about this. The EL2 lid, this extracellular loop, it significantly increases the residence time of LSD because it closes LSD inside of the receptor and prevents it from dissociating readily. And LSD size allows the lid to close over the binding pocket, but the diethylamide moiety is what changes the conformation of the receptor and allows the receptor to shift in such a way that it can latch the lid closed with nonpolar interactions between amino acids. 
And finally, LSD is gaining a lot of traction, surprisingly, as a therapeutic drug, um, specifically in the treatment of and remission of cluster headaches, um, as well as the treatment of some psychiatric conditions like depression or addiction. And LSD also has applications to conditions like Parkinson's disease. I believe that further research definitely needs to be done on the beta arrest and signaling pathways, um, fully understanding the beta arrest and signal cascading effects would be huge for drug development. However, it's a very daunting task because there is much involved in this. And of course, the molecular neuropharmacology of serotonin receptors, um, I believe is going to see a big boom in the future, especially with the discovery of this lid that the serotonin receptor has. Because if we could exploit this with drug development, then we can greatly increase the potency of certain drugs and their residence time. And also understanding how certain conformations of the serotonin receptor cause hallucinogenic effects, we could potentially detangle the hallucinogenic effects of certain psychedelic drugs from other interesting functions of the serotonin receptor. And also, I believe that there's a future possibility of using this information to develop novel hallucinogens for therapeutic applications where a psychoactive dose of LSD proves useful 